Welcome to our Spring 2018 Faith Groups study. We're delighted you've joined us and pray God will bless the discussions and interactions and study in each of your small groups. We just celebrated another Easter Sunday and the joyful proclamation that Christ is risen from the dead. This beautiful glass window, stained glass window in the sanctuary tells that story and reminds us of it each time we see it. Across the bottom, it has the words of Jesus from John chapter 20. I ascend to my Father and to your Father. Easter is the most important day of the whole church year. For some reason, more traditions have grown up around Christmas. But theologically, Easter is the most important event. In fact, it's more than just an amazing event. It is the linchpin of the gospel. Everything else in the Christian faith depends on it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Without the resurrection, everything else collapses. In fact, later in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul just lays it on the line. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ we are of all people most to be pitied. Now that's how most translations in English have that verse. And it makes sense. Paul's talking about the resurrection, that we, we hope not only in this life, but that there is a life to follow. But in Paul's original Greek, the point is even more powerful. Because there the word only is not attached to this life, but rather it's attached to hope. And that's where the title of this series comes from. If for this life we have only hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. That is, if the resurrection is only a vain hope and not a reality, well then we Christians are pretty pathetic for putting any kind of trust or confidence in it. So everything depends on the resurrection. But is the resurrection dependable? Many people say no. And that and a host of other objections to Christianity are often raised today. You may hear them from family members or friends. They pop up incessantly on the internet and other social media. And it's important to note that there's nothing particularly new about that. Already in Matthew 28, it's reported that the Jewish religious leaders devised a tale that the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus and spread it around and that story was still being told as Matthew wrote his gospel. Outside of Judaism, the Greek philosophers dismissed the whole notion of resurrection and of Christian faith as, frankly, ridiculous. But the chief objection today is a little different. It's often said that the Christian faith isn't rational. Although when people say that, what they really mean is that it's not empirical. That is, that we can't establish it through our five senses or in any kind of scientific way. We've never seen a resurrection, so there can't be one. In the same way, God isn't visible to our eyes, so therefore he doesn't exist, is a figment of our imagination. And therefore, on the flip side, faith is dismissed as a fairy tale or a delusion. There can't be any actual truth to Christianity, at least in a historical or rational way, because we can't prove it empirically. Limiting knowledge, or what's real, to what can be perceived by our five senses is portrayed as more sophisticated, more mature, more informed than believing what we have been told. And when Christians hear those kinds of objections, they often struggle to respond and to know how to give a cogent answer in return. But is the resurrection, is the rest of the Christian faith really on that shaky ground? Have we only hoped in Christ for this life and therefore are of all most to be pitied? Those are the questions that we'll pursue throughout this faith group's study. 
And we're going to start with the resurrection. Are the accounts of Jesus being raised from the dead in the Bible reliable? Can we count on them as being true? Well, it's important to know that Jesus' resurrection was a unique event in human history. There are no parallels to it. Sometimes people will point to certain pagan myths that seem to have a similar theme. But actually, they're not the same when you actually read those myths. The Jewish people, including Jesus, believed in a general resurrection of the dead at the last day. But they had nothing like the resurrection of an individual, like Jesus, on Easter Sunday. So nothing else corresponds to Jesus' resurrection in human history or in human religion. So it's not empirically provable. That is, by the usual ways of knowledge. There's no lab test. There's no um, other proof that can be run for this. Nevertheless, there are lots of solid reasons to see the gospel as completely reliable and trustworthy. In the time we have left in this first uh, session, I just want to focus on four key factors that support the reliability of the resurrection. Now, this is a very simplified version of all four of these. There are books that will go into them in, in much more detail and make a better case. But this brief presentation will give you a sense of how we can make a case that the resurrection is reliable. The first basis for the reliability of the resurrection is here in the Bible. Now, the skeptics will immediately object. Well, you can't use that. That's religious literature. That's not scientific or rational. But in this case, we're not talking about the Bible's meaning or message, but simply its existence. Because it shows that the source material underlying Jesus' resurrection is huge. Now, when we say the sources for Jesus' resurrection, it doesn't just mean the number of descriptions of it, but the different places where we can trace a witness to it. For example, Matthew and Luke both used Mark as a source for their gospel. We know that. So that's not three sources. Mark would be the one source. Whatever witness he had to the resurrection that he incorporated into his gospel. On the other hand, Matthew and Luke have material that Mark doesn't have. So those would be additional sources of material. Well, when you add up the various sources of the resurrection that we can identify through the ancient manuscripts, the number is overwhelming. William Lane Craig has written this. Historians consider themselves to have hit historical pay dirt when they have two independent accounts of the same ancient event. But we have the remarkable number of at least five independent sources for Jesus' burial, some of which are extraordinarily early, meaning they came very close to the event itself. But beyond those identifiable sources, they in turn point to other witnesses and sources to this event. For example, the four gospel accounts all name, by name, the women who went to the tomb. They're not just nameless, fam faceless people, but named women who went to the tomb. Or again, in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul witnesses to the reality of the resurrection. He says that the risen Jesus appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, the apostle, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 believers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now you'll note that all of those appearances were only to believers. These were not public events. And yet the risen Jesus appeared to hundreds of witnesses. And some of them, Paul says, still alive. He virtually dares the Corinthians to check it out for themselves. 
that they don't only have to take his word for it, but there are many others who can tell the same story. Another piece of evidence for the reliability of the resurrection is the sudden, total, stunning transformation of Jesus' disciples. You know, in the Gospels, there's not a very flattering portrait of them. They're slow to understand. They're self-centered, quarreling. They're shown here at the Last Supper, but shortly after that, Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied him. The other disciples fled from him. And in the days after, they showed no expectation that Jesus would rise from the dead, even though he had told them earlier that he would. And yet suddenly, shortly after Easter, these very same bumbling disciples are transformed into bold, fearless apostles, willing to defy authorities and to risk martyrdom. I mean, that cannot just be a psychological change or a desire to preserve Jesus' memory. Some dramatic, life-changing event had to have occurred to make such a difference in their character. Hans Schwartz has said, something seems to have occurred in Jesus' followers that goes beyond the normal conceptual possibilities of humans and instead is an immediate activity of God. There was a divine experience that changed these disciples into such bold apostles. Well, on what basis would we reject their own testimony as to what that divine event was, knowing that Jesus was raised from the dead? But there's another piece to this, too. It's not only the disciples were transformed as witnesses, but it was also the content of that witness. After Easter, they began to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Now, Lord was a common title in the ancient world. It was applied to pagan gods. The Roman emperors were called Lord. Among Greek-speaking Jews, they used Lord in place of God's name when they talked about God. But what about Jesus would warrant calling him Lord? Itinerant rabbi from a small town who had about 15 minutes of fame? He's rejected by the religious leaders of his own people, the chief priests, betrayed and denied by his own disciples. He died a cursed death normally reserved for traitors or thugs. I mean, it would be absurd to try to claim that Jesus is Lord, unless, again, there's some dramatic divine invent in there that cuts against all that other evidence. And yet, from the very start, the heart of the Christian message is that Jesus is Lord. And what was the reason given for that claim? That God had raised him from the dead. In fact, more so in Colossians 1, Paul says that Christ is the end point of all creation, that all things were created through him and for him, that in fact, he is. Lord, to whom all of history is moving. I mean, if the disciples were just making this up, would anyone have bought it? Of course, despite these arguments, many people, just like the chief priests in Matthew 28, still insist that it was just all a conspiracy. The disciples stole Jesus' body, destroyed it, and then invented the resurrection as an explanation and that they needed it just to comfort themselves in their despair, or to justify the fact that they had believed in a failed leader, or maybe that they were just con men out to dupe people. But if that were the case, we have to say that they ran the worst conspiracy that's ever been tried. Broke like all the rules. I mean, if you're going to run a conspiracy, you want to limit the people who are in the know. And yet, they claim that hundreds of people knew. You want to make sure you have the story straight and the details the same. And while the Gospels agree on the core events, 
they differ in all sorts of details as they tell the story. I mean, this has none of the marks of a rehearsed tale. And of course, if you're trying to sell a conspiracy, you want to put it on the most credible basis possible. But here the evangelists really blew it because they all admitted that the first witnesses to the resurrection were women. And in that patriarchal age, women were not considered to be reliable witnesses. I mean, even in Luke 24, when the women come back and report that Jesus is raised, it says the disciples considered it an idle tale and did not believe them. Or there was a Greek philosopher named Celsus who was an ardent opponent of Christianity. And he dismissed the entire faith on this one piece alone, that the witnesses of the resurrection were women and we all know we can't trust what they say. So why invent a resurrection and not something more plausible. If you're going to run a conspiracy, why not make it tighter and more believable? In 1 Corinthians 1, St. Paul says that the cross, the idea of a crucified Savior, is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And understand, those are the only two groups of people in the world. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So it's a scandal or foolishness to everyone. Well, the idea of a crucified Savior then being raised from the dead would have been no different. A scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And if this were actually a conspiracy, there's every reason to think it would have failed miserably, not endured for the next 2,000 years. The last reason for the reliability of the resurrection that we want to talk about today is right here. The existence of the church. I mean, what are the odds that there would be not only this, but all sorts of Christian churches here 2,000 years later on the other side of the world? I mean, that the church not only survived, but that it flourished is absolutely amazing. But even harder to explain is how rapidly and dramatically it grew. History is littered with stories of failed religious movements. And that included the time around Jesus in Israel. Timothy Keller notes, in the decades before and after Jesus' life and death, there were dozens of messianic movements in Israel. In almost every case, the messianic leader was killed, almost always by execution. And after the leader's death, each of these movements collapsed. Everybody went home, and that was it. In fact, of all those dozens of movements, only one did not collapse after the death of the leader. And not only did it not collapse, it exploded. In the course of about 300 years, it had spread through the entire Roman Empire. Well, what could have caused that? and then sustained it, except the extraordinary event that the disciples themselves credited for it, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, of course, the skeptics will say, well, there are other world religions that have persisted and kept their members through the years, and that's true. And yet each one of those needs to make its own case for its authenticity and truth. If Christianity is based in a unique historical event, that makes Christianity unique. How do other world religions compare to the resurrection and the implications of it? If the resurrection is reliable, we have a unique claim to how God is working to save the world. Now, one last point about arguments like these. It's not finally possible to prove by rational means that Jesus is Lord. We can establish the existence of Jesus of Nazareth and other historical facts like that. But confess, to confess Jesus as Messiah and Lord is the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Again, Hans Schwartz writes, a strict test of proof for the resurrection cannot be conducted because whenever God is involved, such occurrences cannot be verified by science. At the same time, though, the possibility of such a divine action cannot be precluded, that is, ruled out. The language of facts pertains to things within our space-time continuum. Anything beyond that can only be disclosed to us by God. And yet, while that's true, it is exactly that greater reality to be disclosed by God that the resurrection discloses. And the reliability of the witnesses points to the reliability of the resurrection and the message that Jesus is raised from the dead. So there's no proof for what only God can reveal, but the testimony to what God has revealed is amply proven. And therefore, there is every reason to cling to the Alleluia's of Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that means that we have not only hope in Christ.